I have with me, well, the man who at our, and he will be taking your call, Dr. Umar Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a psychologist and pan-Africanist. He wrote the book, Psycho-Academic Holocaust, uh, The Special Education and ADHD War Against Black Boys. Very interesting. And I wanted to talk to him about these and other issues. Um, Dr. Johnson, welcome to the show, sir. Good morning. The honest mind. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here, buddy. Uh, the, the first thing I'd like to ask you, uh, just take about 10 seconds or so, what is a Pan-Africanist? Pan-Africanist is someone who believes that all African people, irrespective of culture, language, religion, clash, or nationality, are members of one human family, and that they should primarily identify themselves as members of of that human family before they identify themselves as members of any other group, religious, secular, or otherwise. So we believe that being African is more important and should take precedence over being Christian, Muslim, a Greek, a Mason, or anything else. And the second tenet of Pan-Africanism is that we have an international responsibility to work together in order to collectively improve the conditions under which African people live. Pan-Africanism posits that we can't really rise as separate groups. We have to rise as one because our conditions are so intimately linked in with one another that you can't possibly realize success on a regional or national level without working with the whole international African family. Amazing. And so does that include white people, too, who are... Raised, born and raised in Africa? Okay. No. Pan Africanism <laughs> believes no. in self reliance. And so when we talk about Pan Africanism, we're talking about a self reliant movement of African people solving their own problems, which is no different than what other groups within the human family do. European Jews primarily work with European Jews, Arabs work with Arabs, East Indians primarily work amongst themselves. So if we look at the way in which most cultures operate, they operate with a degree of exclusivity. And as African people, we reserve the right to also be exclusive. So are you saying that uh, color first, then religion, nationality, nationality, national, nationality, and then the rest? Not color, because color is a superficial characteristic. Color is nothing more than a symbol of culture and history and biological connectivity. So we would say African family first. Not all Africans have an obvious African look. Most of us do. You can generally tell who is and is not a direct descendant of the original inhabitants of Nile Valley culture. But not all of us look obviously or phenotypically African. We have Africans who can look European and look like other races because we are the mothers and fathers of all other people. It's not uncommon to see some of us look like other people. But yes, most of us are phenotypically African, but not all of us. So, so it's the DNA that makes us African. So it's African first and then the rest. But let me ask, in Amer- this doesn't include black Americans who were born in this country. We're not a part of that stuff, right? Because we are of Americans. But how? Oh, no, sir. But how is that? No, I, I mean, for me, for an example, with me, for an example, I was born in America, down in Alabama, and I'm 100 percent American. So I wouldn't be a part of this African stuff, right? No, that's totally incorrect. Pan Africanism, as a philosophy, was actually born in the Western Hemisphere. Pan Africanism came from the Americas. It came from the Caribbean and went to Africa. So believe it or not, ironically, uh, it was created by, quote, unquote, um, American Africans. And so when we talk about Pan-Africanism, as I said earlier in this definition, it includes all African people, wherever we may live. That's the entire purpose of the philosophy, is to make African people understand that regardless of where you may be, you're still African. There's European Jews all over the planet 
but they're still European Jews. They but I'm not Irish. African, though. I don't, I don't feel like an African. I don't think like an African. I don't look like an African. Well, that's because of I, I am 100%, disorder. I'm 100% American. If you choose to identify politically as an American, not that politically, is the right. I am an American. Okay, well, allow me to make my statement. If you choose to psychologically and politically identify as an American, then so be it. But genetically and biologically, you may be African. No, I'm but not. Biological, biological, well, it's okay to be in denial. Most Africans are. You have to understand we suffer from a collective psychosis. Is this and it like, like that you might be suffering from that yourself? Is this like that stuff that Louis Farrakhan and and uh, Jeremiah Wright Jr. Obama's preaching talk about this black um, liber- this I'm black liberation follower. this oh. black let me just ask this black liberation stuff that's what this is all about. Well, let me clarify. I respect Minister Farrakhan and Reverend Wright, but I'm not followers of either. Uh-huh. I think they've done some good things, but neither of them are Pan African. Um, and I think to get a the most accurate representation of what they stand for. You would probably need to speak with one of Minister Farrakhan's ministers. He has several who are more than capable of answering those questions. I wouldn't want to speak for what he actually stands for. Um, I'm a Pan-Africanist. He's not. So, the, um, you know, although we both fight for the liberation of black people, we have two different ideologies. So then, what would you say uh, about this thing that's happening in America? You have black Africans coming here into this great nation and they're doing very well. They're getting educated. They're starting their own businesses. They have strong families. And the blacks who live here because they have been whimping and whining and begging for so long, relying on the government and have their children out of wedlock and looking to the so-called black leadership to do and think for them, they are jealous of those black people who are coming here and becoming more independent. So they're not getting along at all. What would you say about that situation if they're okay. all one? Well, Okay. Well, first, I would not agree with your assessment. First off, I do not think that African Americans are jealous of our brothers and sisters. Well, why do they fight with them the way they do with the white folks? Well, if you look at our history under white supremacy, you will find that there has been the engineering of internal differences amongst African people. You see those internal differences at play. So the white man is to blame for that, too? Let me allow me to finish. If I could, I'll <laughs> okay. be brief. Right. But you see those internal differences at play every day in Africa, where there are no, where there are no African Americans present, and you also see those internal differences at play here in America, even when Africans from the continent are not here. We have been engineered to work against each so other. So the We've white man, the white man is making the black black Americans fight against the black African. So blacks don't have any sense at all. Are you saying that? Let me take no, a break. I'll saying. let you respond when I come back. 888-7753-773. Back in a moment. Dr. Umar, Umar Johnson is with me. He is a psychologist and pan-Africanist. He wrote the book Psychoacademic Holocaust and uh, the Special Education in H A H. ADHD war against black males. I want to talk to him about that as well and tell you how to get his book. Um, so, Dr. Johnson, are you telling me that black people in America are so dumb that white people can even cause them to be jealous of black Africans who come here and do very well? I think that what you're failing to recognize is when you control access to opportunity, you can sow the seeds of division and uh, behavior that causes members within a particular group to work against their own best interests, to look out for their own selfish personal advancement. And that's exactly what happens amongst African people. For example, and I work with Africans from the continent. I'm a Pan-African. I'll be going to Ghana this summer, leading a so, group trip. So is that a yes? Let me make the statement. Let me make the statement. Let me make the statement, please. Because when you deal with these types of issues, they're not yes, no answers. You have to provide the context. And what I briefly want to say is that when Africans come to America, and I know this because I've been told this by many Africans here, 
they are told, okay, when they come through customs, when they come through immigration, that they would be better off if they didn't deal with Africans who are already here. They're told this when they go through their orientations that it's best to stay away from us. So many of them are afraid of mixing with African-Americans because they understand that the American government does not look favorably upon us. And if you're here on a student visa or a work visa or any type of other temporary uh, placement in America, you can be deported very quickly if they catch you working with Dr. Umar Johnson. So that's one of the reasons for the schisms between us and them. They're not allowed to be around us without being risking deportation. Amazing. So that is a yes that the white man influence is so great that he can influence black Americans to hate black Africans when they come Black here. Americans do not hate Africans. They are we jealous of them. They're success. I do not believe that at all. They're always saying that African these Africans are jealous of an African. They're always saying that these, that. they say that these African people who come here, the blacks who come here, uh, think that they are better than we are. So that is jealousy. Well, That's the same well, thing they said well, about the whites, the Jews, okay. any group that have done well can in I, this country. Can I, let me, let me say this. Two things you're overlooking. Uh, number one, the Africans who are allowed to come to America are allowed to come here because customs and immigration knows that they're not going to get out of hand. There's a lot of revolutionary Pan-Africanists in Africa who have never been allowed to come to America. I have friends in Senegal, friends in Nigeria, friends in South Africa who've been trying to come to America not to live, just to visit me. And their visas have constantly been turned down. But there so are a lot Africans of folks who try to come here and can't on, get hold here. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me. The Africans who, who is allowed to come to America is not the one who's likely to work with African people against white supremacy for our collective betterment. Well, we don't the want troublemakers here. Well, I don't consider someone fighting for their rights a troublemaker. When the European Jews stood up against the Nazis, they weren't making trouble. They were defending their human rights. And that's exactly what we do when we stand up. Now, if defending our rights, our human rights, makes us troublemakers, then so be it. But the other thing you're missing, the other thing you're missing is all immigrants who come to America are giving preferential treatment over African Americans because we are not wanted here. The other thing you're who missing don't want you is here. all immigrants. Hold on. All no, who don't want you here, sir? To America. No, let, sir. Me, let me finish this. No, statement. tell me this first. Who listen, don't want you? Who don't want you here? I'm listening to you. No, Jeff, you're not listen. listening to me. You, 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 you. Let me make. This I statement. ask you a question, and you go statement. on and on. Two seconds. Two seconds. Two second statement, and that is this. All other non-white peoples who come to America are giving access to capital and resources that allows them the opportunity to build up business and commerce. And the same banks that give them that opportunity practice financial racism against black people, oh, which prevent us from having an opportunity to build up economic infrastructure. Racism is at the root of all of the ills that we suffer, Jesse. Okay. We do not control the miseducation system. We, we gave do not you a, control the criminal Doctor, justice hold on. system. Hey, hold we on. do not control the economy. Doctor, hold on. Stop um, blaming the victim. You said a I lot. I need you, my brother. Hold on. To start, stop blaming the victim, and I need you to start loving your people, and I want you to be an argument for your people and not for their oppressors. Doctor, let me, you're saying a lot here. Uh, first, are you comparing white Americans to the Nazis? We could. And that's what you're doing? Are you doing that? We could. Yes. Yes, we very well could because the... I said, are you doing that? Yes. The the extermination (laughs) campaign, the extermination campaign against African (sighs) men in America is no different than the Nazi extermination campaign of European Jews. They are identical. What is being done to black men now? You have concentration camps in America right now called prisons. 95% 95% of black people in those prisons are not there because they committed a crime. They're there because they cannot afford adequate, decent representation. Well, why do you they need, why do they need representation? Why did they, hold on, hey, hey, hold on, hold on. Represented on death row. Why did they need black representation? People. Did they do anything why that required? Because they, they've been charged. 
Okay, so they did something that required them to need it. False crime. Hold on, I want to go back to something else you said. Was being black. Dr. The Johnson, only hold on. Crime a minute. they committed hey. was being black, my brother. Okay, calm down. Um, no, I'm calm. I'm very calm. No.